You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. The mandate, which is the sort of the thing that divests our court of jurisdiction, is put on hold. And this mandate is a very important thing for our court because we, we have to hold on to that mandate until our court has spoken its final word on the case. A very important part of case closing is just the fact that jurisdiction is transferring from our court back to the district court. And it's very important that that procedure is followed correctly. Case managers should be very organized, uh, should have a thorough understanding of the FRAP rules, um, have good communication uh, skills, and uh, basically not be afraid to ask questions. We feel a sense of accomplishment. We have basically worked with the case from the beginning to the end, and then it's finally over our desk, and we've done our part. Once an opinion has been initially rendered in an appellate case, you might think the case is closed. But there's quite a bit more that still has to happen before a case is formally closed and a mandate issued. Hi, I'm Bob Fagan with the Federal Judicial Center, and I want to welcome you to our third broadcast on the administration of appellate cases. On today's broadcast, we're going to take a look at some of the processes and some of the challenges that appellate court staff face during the period from when an opinion is rendered to the issuance of the mandate and the formal closing of the case. As a result of this broadcast, we hope you'll be more familiar with issues and challenges facing court staff during the case closing phase, be able to identify some techniques and effective practices developed by other court units to meet those challenges, and be familiar with some of the information sources that might provide assistance to you. Let's take a minute to look at today's agenda. In our first panel, we're going to discuss opinions dissemination practices, as well as the collection of statistical case closing data. Our second panel discussion will focus on how petitions for rehearing are handled, including rehearing and bank. Again, the focus will be on challenges that are faced and effective practices that have been utilized. Finally, our third panel will cover practices relating to issuances of the mandate and records management. As part of our discussions, we'll also bring in returning to court staff via conference call who have volunteered to share their practices in each of these important areas. These court units will tell us what works for them. These same practices may not work in your court, but that's for your judges and your court to decide. We'll have a final wrap-up at the end. So we've got quite a bit to talk about in just a very short period of time. We want to encourage all of our folks to participate, ask questions, share your thoughts with us. We have a toll-free fax number that will appear on the screen throughout this broadcast. Please feel free to use the fax form that was also on the jnet.fjc.dcn at any time during the broadcast. And don't forget that the participant guide is also available at the site. If you haven't already downloaded it, you may want to pay special notice to the effective practices submitted by your colleagues and included as part of the guide. Okay, let's get started now with our first panel discussion, Opinions Dissemination and the Collection of Statistical uh, Case Closing Data. Let me introduce the members of our first panel to you. They are Susan Dino, Case Closeout Supervisor with the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, and Cynthia Motley, Court Services Manager with the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Let me welcome both of you. Uh, we're going to be focusing on case closing. That's obviously a very, very critical period of time. There's still, as mentioned before, quite a lot of activity that uh, remains to be done. And in this particular panel, we're going to uh, really focus on opinions dissemination, a big process in every court, and the collection of statistical case closing data. Cynthia, let me start with you. Uh, the panel has reached an opinion. What happens next in terms of preparing the opinion for dissemination. What's the process that's uh, uh, used in the uh, Seventh Circuit? Um, well, the very first thing that uh, needs to be determined wh is whether the decision is going to be published or unpublished. And by local rule, that's determined by the majority of, of the panel. Uh, for the published opinions, uh, the authoring judge assigned drafts an opinion. 
Uh, that uh, draft is then emailed from Chambers to directly to our printer and also to the clerk's office. And then from the clerk's office uh, point, we begin a manual log of so we can track down the opinion from the draft till it's actually released. And there's a little bit of data quality in there as well where we uh, look for uh, format things that we might uh, suggest to judges for possible changes they might want to consider. Things like um, how the caption, um, you know, conventions, uh, lower court numbers, uh, seniority of judges, and, and so on. So we jot down notes as to what we're going to uh, suggest if we find anything. And uh, once the printer gets the draft, um, then they, when they have what they have what we call a, a galley uh, that then gets sent to the uh, clerk's office and we once again log that in and uh, include uh, any suggestions that we have along with the, with the draft and send it to the to the judges chambers and uh, they make their changes at that point they review it uh, and make whatever changes and then they once again forward it back to the clerk's office we once again log it in and uh, then we send that to the printer and um, that's that as far as that process. So you're making formatting changes. You obviously are not making any changes on the opinion itself. That's right. for chambers to right. do. Substantive changes yeah. as to content are made uh, in judges' chambers. But things like also case numbers or anything, any of that vital data, that kind of data you will make. Correct. Okay. Uh, Susan, same question to you. Does that differ at all from what you do in the Eighth Circuit? It does somewhat. It doesn't seem as if we have quite as many steps. Our opinions also come directly from chambers, from the authoring judge. And we will go through a process of, of screening that, making sure that it meets all the guidelines uh, for opinion set up, things like uh, whether it's, it states if it's published or unpublished, mm -hmm. uh, the opinion or the, uh, the um, form or the, <laughs> the judges, if they're in the yeah. correct order, mm -hmm. seniority wise. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, we're looking for things like uh, single lines hanging on pages, widows and orphans, that type of thing. And we'll, we'll correct those small things that, that we see. If there's anything larger, it will go back to chambers for them to correct. And we will um, make sure it looks perfect. Once it does, we'll put a date on it, which is um, we date those two days ahead to allow for printing. And uh, we will reformat those into PDF send all of them to our automation department which posts those on our website the day of issuance and um, the printing is done uh, we have a local printer that comes and picks those up anything any opinion that is nine pages or more is done by our printer and we have recently started to print in-house any opinions that are eight pages or less and that's working so that really little, well I'm sure that saves a little time time and, and, and money, money. Mm -hmm. right um, of course, all the opinions that come down look perfect when they uh, come down. Do you uh, have a, um, I think we had spoken once before about with visiting judges, sometimes they're not quite familiar right. with. Uh, right, we do have um, visiting judges occasionally that author opinions. And um, although we do give them a, a nice guideline printed handout, um, it, they don't do it as often. And so they're just not as familiar uh, with the exact format and how it should look so we do have to revise those a, a good deal of the time uh, we will ask them to resend it if it's you know really bad but most of the time we'll try and fix it up mm -hmm. for them so the importance one like in all of our other broadcasts having to do with appellate uh, uh, case management real emphasis on communication real emphasis on quality control let's take it um, one step further now um, you've got it back now the question is how are you disseminating it who gets it? Um, how is it available to the public? If you use the web, um, when does it get on the web, Cynthia? Uh, well, for us, the the very very first step is to uh, call uh, the attorneys and the lower court judge that authored the original decision from the lower court. Uh, once that's taken care of, uh, our printer uh, emails us a PDF version of of the opinion, and that gets uploaded into onto our website, and that's available to the public. Uh, as far as mail, mailing from the clerk's office, we do a limited mailing uh, at, on that day, and uh, it's usually to counsel uh, the press mm -hmm. and uh, a hard copy to the lower court judge. Um, get, those get mailed. But the, the massive mail from our, our subscribers list is done by a printer on a weekly basis, and uh, so they, get, they take care of distributing to uh, the other lower court judges or district court judges. Um, 
in our circuit as well as any paid subscribers uh, on our list. You obviously let then the, the judge from the lower clerk know right away because right. Uh, you want to have that judge start to think in terms once even though the mandate comes later. Right. Um, we started that process uh, as, as courtesy actually to the lower court judge uh, so that they know firsthand, particularly if a case is, is being remanded, uh, so that they know before the press knows and then they're not surprised with the phone call and saying, <laughs> by the way, how do you think about this opinion and so on and they've never heard of it. Oh, it's likewise, with, with same thing with the attorneys. So that's why we always make sure that they are called first. Uh, so that, that we make sure that they know before, and that's the day of the release. Mm -hmm. And they're aware, especially if it's remanded, they're aware right. that the clock, once the mandate is issued, the Correct. clock will start. Correct. Start ticking. Uh, Susan, again, same kind of a question. How is it in the, uh, how is it in the A circuit? Right. We also do an advance copy to our district court judge, and that is actually two days before it, the opinion really issues. Mm -hmm. So they've got some warning. Um, especially if it's reversed or remanded, they like to know that. They like to be the first one to know that. So um, we do send that, and then the day that the opinion is filed, we um, send hard copies to all counsel of record, and also an electronic email or fax copy to those that are signed up for our electronic noticing system. Um, those that are not signed up will only just get the mailed copy, which will take a few days, and we don't call them and give them an advance warning. So that's a little bit of an incentive to sign up for our electronic, electronic noticing sure, system. Sure. And, um, and then we will also um, give printed copies to all of our Eighth Circuit judges. And we have the uh, U.S. District Court, Eastern Missouri, in our building, so they all get printed copies as well. Locality is everything. Absolutely. <laughs> a little courtesy there. And um, we have a subscriber list that receive them email every day. And there's about 60 on that mm -hmm. list. That includes the press. And then um, there's a subscriber list of about 100 that we mail to once a week. And the printer used to mail that as well, but now since we're printing some in-house, mm -hmm. he brings his half and then, and then we add what we've printed to that and send those out yeah. every week. You've also let folks know that there's a certain time of the day that, um, that you announce your that's right. Your we opinions. only issue our opinions once a day, and that's right at 10 a.m. That's when they all go on our website. And everyone in, in the circuit knows that's our practice, so they'll watch and look for those. And Or if they're calling to find out whether their opinion's been issued, they know that they can call shortly after 10, and they won't have to call again until the next day. <laughs> but the public also has access then on, on the website to some of the opinions that everyone All of our opinions. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I mentioned before that we have uh, a number of folks from uh, other various other circuits joining us today and uh, they have very graciously uh, volunteered to uh, tell us a little bit about some of their effective practices. And uh, we have Debbie Graham, the Opinions Department Supervisor from the Fifth Circuit uh, on the line right now. Um, Debbie, I understand your circuit handles the dissemination of opinions a little differently in terms of getting it on the web when you get it on the web, right? Uh, yeah, we put it on a little faster than some of the other okay. courts. So let me tell you a little bit how we do it. Oh. Okay. First of all, we receive our opinions from the judges' chambers, and once we get them in the office... Can you hear us then? Okay. No, we'll, we'll mute. I'm hearing some background noise. Go ahead. Go ahead, Debbie. Okay. And once we receive the opinions, we request an electronic version from the chambers, and then we do our quality check just like the other courts do. Titles, appeal lines, outstanding motions. Make sure the decisions are the same at the beginning and the end. And if we see any problems, we just call the writing judge, have them fix them, and then <coughs> send them back to us, and then we release them. <coughs> so what you we do is we, excuse me? No, go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, once everything's fine and we have them back in our office, we run a macro that puts a file stamp on them. And then we prepare our form letters by docketing our entries and aims. And the form letters are what goes out to the parties, the counsel, and all that. And then we prepare a judgment. And once that is done, we set up, we run a process to put the opinions on the Internet, and it just sits in the holding place until 12 and noon, and 12 noon and 5 o'clock. And once we do all that, we make all our copies to go to the district court judges, to the parties, to the 
publishing companies, if it's a published opinion, to the press, um, various other people we send mm -hmm. copies to. And so you announce it twice a day, correct? Twice a day. Twice a day. And I'm also hearing that you really do put it on the web a lot earlier than, uh, than either uh, Susan or Cynthia's circuits. Um, you, uh, am I hearing correctly that you actually put it on before it, uh, it goes to the printer, per se? Oh, yeah, before and, it goes to the printer. And that's a preference on the part of your judges? Yes, the judges prefer it because they want the parties to, get, you know, to be able to have access to their opinion as soon as possible. Great. Well, thank you, Debbie. Thanks for sharing that practice with, uh, with us. You're welcome. Um, let me ask each of you around the table now. We've kind of defined the process, including the role of staff. Um, um, noted a few of the differences um, between your circuits, um, but one commonality in all cases, it requires a lot of responsibility for, uh, from, on the part of case managers, legal staff, and others to review, to, to do editing, and, and what have you. Um, define for, for uh, me some of the challenges that, and, th and issues that fa uh, uh, court staff face, you think, and some of the skills that they need for success. Susan, let me turn to you first. Okay. Um, well, some of the challenges, as we mentioned before, with the visiting judges, um, authoring and sending opinions. Um, and also, I think some of the skills definitely would be uh, the attention, attention to detail, just uh, making sure that everything is perfect on that opinion before it, it goes out and gets printed and mm -hmm. put out on the website. Uh, it's so much easier to have it right the first time than to have to do a correction later. And, and we do do some of those, but uh, I'm happy to say most of them are, aren't the fault of the clerk's mm -hmm. office. So, uh, Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia. Um, I would have to agree that uh, definitely an eye for detail is a, is a uh, required skill, an important skill in, in the opinions. Uh, we don't share your, your problem of visiting judges because we don't have visiting judges in our circuit. Uh, so that, uh, uh, that process for that stage uh, for us seems to be a little bit more, um, it kind of takes, there are very little problems that we encounter mm -hmm. in that area. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about determining which opinions are published, which, uh, which are unpublished, and how you handle them. Susan? Um, that decision is actually made in chambers of the authoring judge. They decide whether the opinion will be published or unpublished and um, let us know that on, on the cover memo that comes with the opinion when they send it to the clerk's office and the face of the opinion should say published or unpublished, especially if it's a per curiam opinion, any that's a, a signed opinion that doesn't say we're treating as a published opinion always. So that's And if it doesn't? You and if it doesn't, right, if it doesn't say either way, and it is a signed opinion, then we do treat it as a published opinion. However, if it's a per curiam and they don't have it on there, we always call them and find out which it is, and we'll add it for them. Same question, Cynthia. Uh, likewise, with us, uh, by local rule, it's uh, whether it's published or unpublished is determined by the panel. And uh, the difference really, uh, the same thing, it's just, it doesn't set precedent, it's, it can't be cited. Uh, like an opinion can. Uh, and then the other difference would be distribution. Uh, unpublished orders uh, have a much smaller distribution than uh, our published orders. They also go out much quicker because we just get the email from the chambers and just uh, print it out and uh, make copies and distribute it. So it's got a very short period. Okay. Um, let's move to the collection of, um, of case closing statistics. Um, and I'm going to throw it right Right back to you, Cynthia, and uh, describe for me exactly what kinds of statistics uh, are collected. Who's responsible for this in, in your particular circuit? Um, do you make them uh, available to the public? Why are they so important? Too many questions. <laughs> uh, let me break them down. Good. <laughs> well, first, uh, all dispositive, dispositive orders we collect statistics for, which I think is pretty common with all the circuits. Uh, in terms of statistic gathering, I would have to say that we actually start, in terms for the opinions, at the time that the draft is, is issued. Uh, as we're reviewing for data quality, we also look for things of how we're going to, uh, at the time of docketing, uh, make that entry in terms of whether it's affirmed, reversed, and so on. You know, and, so on. Um, and then I would say that in terms of the uh, formal gathering, 
um, our docket clerks are very essential to that part. Uh, once, uh, once the order is, is being entered and if we're issuing uh, docketing an opinion or, or a Circle Rule 53 is what we call our unpublished orders, they docket them, they issue the judgment in those, and they also docket a JS term, which I think is common among all circuits to report to the AO. And th that gathers our statistics monthly. And uh, in terms of um, also uh, with our publishers, uh, once an opinion or a Circuit Rule 53, or an unpublished order, I'm sorry, issues, uh, we send a copy of our public docket sheet uh, indicating the basic information of the case, also uh, the attorneys that argued in the cases that have been argued. Uh, so then that's, that's for that part. Susan. Okay. Um, We've created a, a setup form that we use to collect statistical data when an opinion is filed. So when we, when we receive the opinion from the cha chambers, our um, closeout deputies take turns, each has a day of the week to set up all opinions for the day, and that person will actually go through each and every opinion, look it up in Ames and collect the information from Ames that they'll need for statistical closing as well as some of the information uh, that they can gather from the opinion itself and fill out the form. That would be everything from the, the members of the panel who authored it, um, the disposition, the um, district court judge and the date of, of the district court uh, judgment or opinion, those are all things that we use not only in the statistical closing entry but also in a form letter that we send to the publishers if the opinion is published. Um, unlike Cynthia, we don't send a docket sheet to them but we send a letter with some of this information and if the case was argued, who argued the case, the attorneys and where they're from, that type of thing. So. Um, we gather all that and then it's also helpful to have that form handy when the opinion and judgment are actually filed two days later all the information is there and, and we make the uh, uh, JS term entry immediately after the opinion and judgment are filed the same case closeout deputy is entering that information so as that's well. that's really a helpful tool for your for the, for it the is. clerks to do that. It is. I want to toss it just for a minute back to, to Cynthia. What about the public? The public does get to see some statistics that are a little a different and on the web. Right. Yeah. We, we uh, post our annual statistics on our website and, and we also have a published uh, uh, version of our statistics also available to the public. Okay. And the same on, uh, in the Eighth Circuit? We, we don't post our statistics on our website. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, our chief deputy actually prepares a thorough statistical report monthly and, and a compilation large report every year but they're not on the website. Well, you've given me a perfect uh, segue here. We have Robin Weinberg, the Chief Deputy of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals on the line. Uh, Robin, your circuit has put a lot of emphasis on the quality control issue of the collection of these statistics. Uh, explain to us what that's all about. Well, we value the accuracy and the reliability of the court's statistics. And with respect to the court's dispositions, as been talked about, um, we look for a lot of information, the disposition of the case, the authorship, whether the case was published or unpublished, is, the judge, is it a judge-directed order or a clerk-directed order, is it an opinion or an order, substantive disposition or procedural, was the case argued or submitted on the briefs, who participated in the panel, a lot of information. And what we've discovered is all of this information is entered into the AIMS system in a single entry, data entry, the JS termination, which closes the case statistically. So, so the accuracy of that single entry is vital to the accuracy of the, of the statistical information that we, ha that we maintain. And, and as a result, we've allocated a lot of resources to making sure that that entry is accurate, um, beginning with the, the deputy clerk who, who makes the initial entry. Um, then, then we have Susan, our unit supervisor, reviews it. Um, all of the entries are checked daily against the court's minutes, and the quality control analyst in our automation unit checks it against the AO JS34 program. So there's a lot of resources um, attributed to um, making sure that that's accurate so that we hopefully the, the, this added effort in quality control will make sure that, we in, we, that our, our statistics are accurate and reliable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, we have a lot of courts out there, and I'm sure that uh, 
They're just dying to add to the discussion, and I want to encourage them to do so by sending us uh, a fax. Again, that number will appear on your screen shortly. Uh, any thoughts, any questions that, uh, that you have uh, relating to any of the topics that we're, that we're going to be discussing, um, I invite you, in fact, to, uh, to send us a fax, and we'll try our best to, to, to answer it. Um, by the way, in addition, we also included, as part of the downloadable participant guide, uh, we included a bibliography for you, and um, I want to cite two of those uh, works. We have uh, Case Management Procedures in the Federal Courts of Appeals that was published in the year 2000 by the Federal Judicial Center, and that provides uh, a careful description of the comparison of, of case management variations among the uh, appellate courts all the way from case opening uh, through uh, what we're going to be talking about, uh, we're talking about today, case closing, and it includes pro se, PLRA, habeas cases, and so forth. A second publication uh, to highlight is Mediation and Conference Programs in the Federal Courts of Appeals. It's a source book for judges and lawyers that was published in the Center for 1997. If you'd like a copy of any of these uh, uh, publications, or in fact anything on the bibliography that uh, was included, you can make the request directly from the Center's website at jnet.fjc.dcn. Let's close the session, uh, this first panel, and move to our second topic, petitions for rehearing. But uh, before we do, we have some additional comments from our friends at the Second Circuit Court of Appeals who also appeared in the opening of this program. Once a case is decided, we uh, rely on technology either to email a decision to the litigants, we will fax frequently a decision to the litigants, and uh, with our website, uh, we now post all our published and unpublished opinions on the website, generally one hour after the decision has been filed. For case closing, when they're returning any documents to the originating court or agency, for example, the record, it needs to be returned to the proper location, of course, as does any closing documents such as a mandates and um, dispositions, opinions, and summary orders. We have to be very precise and detailed in our correspondence with them so that they'll be able to take advantage of the time constraints that they have and be able to file their motions in a timely fashion. Making the district court clerk's office understand that we cannot give it to you instantaneously unless the court, our court order, the Second Circuit Court's order says that the case should be mandated forthwith. If it's not done correctly, the case is in limbo, the case is still open, and I think it's very important for me to know that justice is being carried out and it's not being delayed. Welcome back. Uh, in this segment, our second panel, we're going to be focusing on handling petitions for rehearing, uh, including in bank. Joining me in this, in this discussion is Susan Dino, whom you've already met. Welcome back, Susan. Uh, in addition, let me introduce Brenda McConnell, briefing case closing manager from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, like in our previous discussion, a lot of important work is being done by court staff during this phase. So it is a very busy period. A lot of petitions uh, for rehearing may, may be before you. Relatively few might be granted, but all have to be processed and, uh, and acted upon. Uh, Brenda, as the new member of the panel, I'm going to turn to you first. Uh, what's the process for handling petitions for rehearing in the 11th Circuit? And, um, what does the clerk's office do? Is there any difference when it comes to handling these petitions in bank? Well, there are some similarities in the way we process them, but there are differences also. One of the similarities is the clerk usually processes them the same way. The clerk still has to um, check for timeliness to see if it's been timely received. If it complies with our formatting requirements, especially on the end banks because we do have a more formal format for that. And I want to ask you about that. Okay, about great, that thank later. you. Yeah. Uh, they have to make the docket entries in our case mm -hmm. management system and uh, to make sure that, that they have the writing judge and the other panel members and all in, in proper alignment. They generate a transmittal memo and um, make sure that they have the memo, the petition, and a copy of the opinion. So those are the similarities. In a panel, that is addressed, a panel petition is addressed to just the three opinion judges. So there's a little difference in there, and that we only require by local rule an original and three copies. 
that goes with a cover memo, which is pink. We're a very color-driven court, so, <laughs> and we want the judges to really see this petition, so it's on, and it's in great bright pink paper. And on that pink paper, we have the case number, the case style, the panel, the identity of all members of the panel, the date that the opinion issued, and um, who the notifying judge is and the notified date. Now, the notifying judge is usually the writing judge or the author of the opinion. However, sometimes we have visiting judges and they are not the notifying judge. At that point, we would designate the senior most active member of the panel to be the notifying judge. And uh, we've had some little quirks with that, too. Um, <laughs> we had an instance where we had two senior members of our court, senior judges and a visiting judge, so we had to decide who was going to be the notifying judge. And we, in that instance, would choose the most senior of the senior judges and it's not by age, because we certainly don't want to offend them in any way, but it is, it is by appointment, who's ever been on the bench the longest. They would receive the order. And then, um, oh, let's see, two minutes right there. Oh, and the notify date is the date by which the other panel members would contact the judge and give their decision of, of you know, whether or not to grant or deny the motion, mm -hmm. uh, the petition. With rehearings and bank, it's a little bit different. They're a little more formal because now you're involving all the judges and, and we require them to pretty much have their ducks more in a row than in a panel petition. A panel petition can come in motion form where it's just stapled up at the left-hand corner. But the end bank, we do require uh, more formal uh, formatting similar to a brief. It has to be bound, left-hand side. It's only allowed the 15 pages, just like a panel. but. It has to have a table of contents. It has to have a, a table of citations, argument, authority, a conclusion. So, uh, and then for that, we require an original and 14 copies, totaling 15 altogether. They are required to have a copy of the opinion, which is filed as an addendum to that petition, so that it's not counted toward the, the page yeah, count, right? Uh, and also for end banks, they have something a little different, where if it's filed by counsel, they have to call what we will file what we could lovingly call an I express a belief statement. And in that, in their most reasoned and counseled uh, position, they have to let the court know why they think the judge's opinion doesn't follow the uh, decisions of the district court and the guidelines set out by the uh, excuse me, Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So that's where that's a little bit different. But they both get the pink memo, they both get a copy of the opinion, and then it is sent on to the court. Okay. Susan, same question. In the Eighth Circuit, how are, how are these handles? Uh, handled? Well, as far as the, the format of the, of the panel and the bank petitions, there really isn't much difference other than that. Like Brenda said, we're also looking for that Rule 35B statement that, that's required in, in, in bank petitions that the decision conflicts with the decision of the Supreme Court or that involves a, um exceptional importance issue, which I'm the sure reason, they all the think it's exceptional. Bank occurring, right, <laughs> right. 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 Um, but we're looking for that. The format... Um, is must much less strict um, than, say, a brief format would be. They're not required uh, to have a colored cover or binding or a table of contents and issues and that type of thing. They'll take it on straight white paper or handwritten or uh, mm -hmm. stapled in the corner. Um, what does differ, differ greatly, though, um, our, our Eighth Circuit practice for actually processing them once we file them is, is unique in that uh, the clerk's office has been given authority to actually routinely deny those petitions unless we hear from the court that they'd like to uh, request a poll or a response. And um, that, if you will, silence is a no vote kind of uh, policy was adopted years ago when um, the court decided that that would be an, an effective practice to, to kind of streamline the over 500 petitions that we process every year. So when we file them and send them to the panel or to the court and bank, either one, we're giving them a date certain, which is, is two weeks from the day that we send it to them, letting them know that if we don't hear from you, we're going to deny this petition. And it works really well. <laughs> and if we do get a, uh, a request for a response, we will call the uh, counsel that's required to file the response because we're only giving them Ten days to do that. So, mm -hmm. uh, if you know, just to speed it along, instead of making them wait to get the letter in the mail, we will call them and let them know. With ten days from today, we're expecting a response from you on that. And when, 
when that happens, we won't automatically deny that petition. We will wait for direction yeah. from the so court. You're, really, you're communicating with the court. The court is going to tell you we are considering this. Otherwise, you right. Will. Right. Not if you wish to keep your job. <laughs> that's right. I won't be denying those on my own. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> that's correct. Um, on our line, we have Patricia Coleman from the Third Circuit. Trish, I understand that uh, you've developed, or your circuit has developed, uh, an electronic petition for rehearing. Um, first of all, how did this come about? Uh, what was involved in putting this together? And then um, how was it processed afterward? Okay. Um, we, we were... In, um, experiencing an increase in petitions for rehearing. We also had some addition, additional judges come on board, so we needed to find a more efficient, both economically and time-wise, method for transmission of the petitions for rehearing. So we got together and talked with the court and talked with automation and determined that the best way to do it was to transmit these petitions electronically to the court. Um, we worked with automation as to try to find which best format to use. We've decided that we create them and convert them to PDF format and send them off to the court in an email. And each chamber then has to download or they can print out the petition as they see fit. Now, do the, do the, um, do the attorneys actually have, have access to this um, electronically then? Um, or is it just is it coming from uh, the clerks to from the clerk's office to chambers? It's coming both ways. Okay. Um, we allow attorneys or parties to file electronically. We've set up a special email mailbox where they can send their petitions in. Otherwise, that they can send them in hard copy, and the clerk's office will scan them in and convert them to PDF. How is it going? Are, are you having many takers? This is something new for them, I'm sure. It's been a little slow um, for the for the electronic filing for the attorneys, but um, for the transmission over to the court, the court they greatly appreciate it. They get them timely. We turn around, we turn them around. On, we have a quick turnaround. Yeah. So we expect that um, as CME ECF comes on board and more attorneys are ex you know become experienced with electronic filing, that more attorneys will take advantage of this opportunity. Talk a little bit about um, how this is processed now, and I think you have Deborah Wall with you. Yes, Bob. Hi, Deborah. How are you? Good. I'm going good, to go good. through the process of what the case managers do. As uh -huh. Trish stated, that there's a mailbox that these petitions are received in. Once the petition is received, the, the um, team leader from the team checks the mailbox and notifies the case manager that there is a petition there. The case manager will then transmit, transfer the petition from the Lotus Notes account over into uh, our WordPerfect account. Then they will check for compliance to see whether, as stated before, whether it complies with all of our rules, if, the, uh, if everything is correct. Um, council also has to include what we call an EPR form, which states what they've included with their email, whether or not it's a petition for rehearing in bank or a panel rehearing, and so forth. If the petition does not comply, then we send them a non-compliance letter. Uh, non-compliance email, rather. We do that electronically back to council, letting them know that their petition is not in compliance and the things that they need to do to correct it. As Trish was stating, we do also receive some hard copies. With those hard copies, we do have them scanned um, and also save them in the appropriate WordPerfect files uh, and then transmit this to the court. We do use a cover letter letting the court know what type of petition petition it is, mm -hmm. as well as whether it's in-bank or panel rehearing, and what we're sending them, whether there's motions included or not. Um, right now, we receive the orders back in hard copy, but soon, um, shortly, we should be receiving the orders back from chambers in electronic form as well. So we'll be doing everything in electronic form. That's the next step. Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, I want to thank both, uh, both Trish and Deb for, uh, Deborah for joining us. For those viewers who are interested in uh, seeing a copy of the instructions for submitting an electronic petition for rehearing we, um, developed by the Third Circuit, we included it as part of your downloadable materials in the participant guide uh, as part of, again, the effective practice that was uh, submitted from the, uh, the Third Circuit. So that is available for you if, uh, if you uh, would like to look at it. Uh, let's turn to another part of, uh, of the topic, uh, one of our favorite topics, a discussion of pro se's. Uh, I bet in the 11th Circuit you have a few requests uh, from uh, prisoner pro se's. Uh, uh, how, they, how are they handled, or are they handled any differently? Well, 
we do handle them a little differently in that we give them a lot of flexibility. We don't hold them to the format of briefing. We receive pro se materials in just about any shape and form. We've received them on uh, paper towels. We one time received, and I'm going back many years when I say this, on um, a toilet roll tissue, and I think that was just his way of getting out his political statement about things. <laughs> but it a was subtle a, statement. a subtle, very, very <laughs> subtle, and. Um, so we do, we do take them in handwritten form, so our clerks have gotten real good at reading handwriting. <laughs> we do have a uh, large Hispanic population in the Southern District of Florida, so sometimes we get them in a different language altogether. Mm -hmm. And luckily we have some folks on staff who can translate that for us. But uh, there are times when we receive those documents where after reading it, I've read it, our motions clerk has read it, we simply cannot figure out what it is they're trying to say. So at that point, we'll send it back to them and say, we've received this. Please clarify it for us. Let us know what it is that you are asking the court. And we'll get something back. Sometimes it's a little better. Sometimes it's not. But at that point, we would go ahead and send it on to the court because they are obviously trying to get something to the judges. They want the judges to look at something again. So right. we'll go ahead and send it. In doing so, when you have to ask for clarification, are you also providing additional time to do that? Because I know the clock is very important. On, for, especially for our pro se prisoners, we will go ahead and send them the document and set them a time limit of 14 days to go ahead and get it corrected. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of extends the time there. And when we get it back within that 14 days, then we'll go ahead and submit it to the court. If the 14 days expires and we haven't received anything, it's out of there. <laughs> what about the length of, of some of these? I know they can be quite long and there is the rule regarding uh, uh, the length, 15 pages. Right. There is only 15 pages allowed for both the panel and the petition for rehearing and bank. If we get the petition early enough where they're within the time frame of, of the, uh, before the rehearing, uh, excuse me, mandate time expires, we will make a phone call, especially if it's an attorney or if it's a non-incarcerated uh, pro se and let them know it's in excess pages, we can't process it. And we give them the option of either getting a motion for excess pages in or to just go ahead and reformat it and into the proper amount of pages. Timing is still, is still critical though. Yes, I mean, always. timing, you can, uh, some of the other allowances are, are permitted, but not right. really not we the timing. We don't mess with the time. Sure. <laughs> Susan. Right, actually, um, yes, we have a 15 page rule as well. Um, and so we, we're looking for that, we're not, um, like I said, as strict about the pro se um, pleadings as we would be with counsel filed, but we, we do look at the length definitely, and um, we will take their petition as um, filed the date of their certificate of service rather than the date that the clerk's office actually received it because we do know that sometimes it sits at the prison facility mm -hmm. before it gets sent out. Um, so we'll so we'll watch for that. Also, if it doesn't indicate that it's been served on opposing counsel, the clerk's office will will serve that and um, show that we have done that in the entry that's made. And uh, we'll make all the required copies. If we get one, we'll make the other 20 to go to the court. So. Let me seg just segue back. Um, wh what do you do? Let's uh, prisoner pro se's um, aside. If if um, Council is sending you something that's more than 15 pages. They they can file a motion for excess pages. I think it's called or right, something like that. The court's permission to accept the petition in a in excess of what it's been allowed by right. the rules. Does the filing of that motion slow the clock down or not really? The clock well, is still running. At that point, we are waiting for a ruling from the judge to let us know whether that we can actually file stamp it and actually lodge it onto the docket. Okay, I'm assuming. But, uh, yeah, that's right. But ours are considered timely filed as of the day we received them, even though we're waiting for mm -hmm. the um, the direction on whether file whether to file it over length or not. Okay, um, we have on our line now uh, from the Second Circuit. The Second Circuit has a unit that deals specifically with pros, uh, prisoner pro se requests, and we have Elizabeth Muniz, the team leader of the prisoner uh, uh, unit, on the line. Um, uh, hi, Elizabeth. How are you? Good. If you would just take one minute to explain how your unit handles the requests from uh, prisoners and some of the challenges you face. Oh, uh, our basic challenge is that unlike most appellants who have readily available access to the courts by either walking in or telephoning their case managers to review their uh, file, 
obviously our appellants are confined and their their restrictions are uh, are usually either through short telephone calls or written correspondence, which at times uh, is not quite legible. Um, due to these constraints, they are uh, we are flexible with them as far as them complying with the FRAP rules as far as the numbers of copies that they must file with regards to motions, briefs, etc. Also, service upon opposing counsel is also offered to them um, in case that they haven't served the appropriate party or haven't served anyone at all. Um, also, uh, we also give them samples of briefs, appendices, and uh, also provide a copy of the FRAP rule for them upon request. So that makes it a little bit easier because at least they get to see examples of what um of what it should look like, but I, I, I'm assuming that the circuit is also fairly liberal in terms of what it accepts uh, uh, from uh, these prisoners. That is correct. Our motions come in various forms, as far as letters, and uh, sometimes they do come in uh, formal forms uh, when they're instructed to do so by the clerk, and the clerk, uh, the case manager rather, provides them with the motion forms directly and detailed instruction on how to fill them out and what to attach to them if they need to attach any supporting documents. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was part of the team that we went to visit in the Second Circuit when we uh, uh, began uh, talking about uh, uh, doing a, uh, an appellate case closing broadcast. Okay, the petitions are received. We all know they all come in all the time in a timely fashion, right? And they're all complete always, right? Um, <laughs> laughing. What happens next? Um, we discussed a little bit about how they're processed. Uh, how is the poll taken? Is it? Uh, I'd like to hear about that. Yeah. Well, in our court, when a judge requests a poll, they do notify the clerk. And at that point, we put a what we call a hold on the mandate. We don't issue the mandate until we either get a denial of rehearing back or whatever kind of ruling from the court about the petition. or that the judge actually lets us go ahead and uh, release the uh, um, mandate. We have had an instance where we've gotten the petition for rehearing order back, but the judge hasn't released the case yet. So we will make a rather diplomatic phone call asking the judge, okay, we've got the denial of rehearing. <laughs> Would you like us to continue to hold the case? The answer is sometimes yes, the answer is sometimes no. But um, that judge who requests the poll also lets the opinion panel know that this is what they would like to do. And that gives the panel the opportunity to review the opinion again and decide whether or not they're going to stand on the opinion or agree that a poll should go forward. Sometimes uh, during this process, we'll get a memo or an email from the judges saying, we've identified another issue that we'd like them to address. So we'll get uh, a request from the court to have a letter brief filed or a supplemental brief filed. And it comes in letter form, just stapled up at the left-hand side. And in it, they'll identify the issue that they want the parties to address. And the judge will set the briefing time for that, when it's due, how much time for response and any reply. And it also will set this page limit. And then once um, that is in the process, the chief judge sends out a ballot to the court. And in the ballot, they are asked to say whether or not they want a request for the poll and whether or not they want it to be orally mm -hmm. argued. And the judges, the timeline they've set for themselves is this 21 days to get back to the chief about how, you know, what their ruling is, whether they want the poll or not. Um, and if the deadline expires, then the chief makes a diplomatic call to the, uh, <laughs> to the judge and asks for their vote at that point. And sometimes it's a deciding vote. You know, it, it'll be the one that sways whether or not there is uh, a poll taken or whether or not they're going to grant the end bank. And after that, once we get the order back, if there has been a poll taken, it's been granted, uh, if the order will come back granted with a whole new opinion, then our opinion section handles the distribution and the mm -hmm. issuing of that. If it comes back with it's granted and we want oral argument, our calendaring section takes care of that. So what's left to us at the briefing case closing is just the straight <laughs> denials, and we get lots of those. <laughs> there you go, and then you're ready to mandate. I'm ready to mandate. <laughs> Uh, Susan, same question. <laughs> well, like I said before, we actually are, are dictating to the court when their poll deadline is. When we send the petition to them, we'll let them know, you know that it will be denied unless 
um, we receive that request for a poll and the votes go directly to our chief judge and so we rarely see those occasionally somebody will copy us in on it but they do um, just go directly to the chief judge and and if they are considering it and a poll is taken and a re response is requested then we're going to make note of that and and hold up on denying it of course and uh, wait for them but uh, Otherwise, we're kind of out of the loop on that. We're just waiting, <laughs> waiting, <laughs> waiting for, for the, the decision. Word. Absolutely, for the right. Okay. Um, we're pleased to have Estella Rusha on the line. Estella is uh, a quality control analyst from the Ninth Circuit. Um, Estella, your, you and your circuit submitted an effective practice relating to uh, quality control uh, on requests for rehearing. And if you would take a minute or so to describe what the challenge was and how your, what your circuit has done to meet that challenge. Right. Uh, hi, Bob. Hi. Uh, yes, our court have developed a, a new uh, way of tracking down petitions for rehearing and rehearing in banks in our court due to the large amount of petitions that we file in our court. And the way that we handled that was by running a report, monthly report. And this report reflects any petitions filed with the court that are outstanding, pending uh, before judges. The way that we developed this uh, kind of report was the reason because uh, we used to show status that actually was inaccurate. And we started developing a, a good way of handling these petitions for rehearing by training docket clerks since it's the more essential um, entry in the docket. Once that docket entry is done correctly, it kind of reflects. I'm sorry, it reflects mm -hmm. everything on the report. Um, uh, they get the petition for rehearing, they check for uh, whether it's timely, whether the format is correct. Uh, then they go, they go ahead and file it and circulate it to the court if it's for name bank uh, rehearing. And if it's for panel rehearing, they will send it to the panel members. At that point, once this petition is filed, then they will have uh, sometimes a response to it. That, entry also needs to be linked with the petition for rehearing so that that way when the order comes down disposing of the petition for rehearing all documents related to the petition for rehearing will be terminated at that point how did you arrive at the standards um, uh, Estella how did you arrive at um, a come to agreement as to what those standards would be did you have to get approval of the clerk and and meet with others etc Yes, uh, actually we had to get approval from the clerk of the court as well to the chief deputy. We kind mm -hmm. of uh, went and uh, developed these uh, standard docketing and procedures for everybody to follow up. And once they approve it, we circulated by a memo to all docket clerks uh, advising the way to be handling uh, orders disposing of petitions for hearings and how they need to be linked with all documents related to it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. We also have uh, Lucille Carr, the operations manager in the Second Circuit, uh, joining us today. Lucille, um, your court, I think, does something uh, quite unique. And uh, if you would please describe uh, the hold confirmation memorandum that, uh, that you've developed. Yes, good afternoon, Bob. How are you? Good. How are you? Hello, ladies. Um, <laughs> we had a challenge of keeping up with what judge put a particular hold on a mandate or petition for a hearing or in bond petition. And it was just nothing in black and white that a person could refer back to, and you weren't sure whether the original panel was aware that a particular judge put a hold on a petition for a hearing or a mandate. And um, it was out of necessity that we needed to create something where the case manager could actually make a docket entry into the system, a form would spit out that we could send to the chief judge so he knows that this particular case is on hold. The three-judge panel would get a copy of that form as well so they'll know that this particular matter is on hold. And we don't ask the reason it's on hold. We, or we don't concern ourselves with that, but we do need to be sure that it's on hold so we don't mistakenly issue a mandate mm. or deny a petition without the judge's approval. Yeah. So the form actually works for as a wonderful communication tool for us. 
and it keeps everybody informed on what cases are on hold. Everybody's talking from the same page, and the clock uh, may or may not run. If if you uh, if you don't understand, or if you uh, you have a different thought, and the clock is running, then you're you're really in a in a mess. So it is a very very excellent communication uh, mechanism. Thank you for uh, for uh, talking about it. Um, as uh, we're ready to turn to our uh, our next panel, and that is dealing with mandate issuances and records management. But uh, as we do that, let's uh, hear some final comments from the folks from the Second Circuit. The challenges, I would say, would be some of the orders are vague and unclear. They don't pinpoint exactly if the case should be dismissed with or without prejudice. The defaults that we have, the attorneys fail to comply with the federal rules of appellate procedures, and that's one of the obstacles that we face with closing and the briefing schedule, they failed to comply with the briefing schedule. There are very strict timing requir requirements that the uh, federal rules of appellate procedure um, re you know, impose on staff members. So they have to be very careful about uh, the timing of particular motions that come following a decision. Uh, because once a decision is rendered by our court, it doesn't mean that the case is over. There are a series of uh, proced procedures that can occur post-decision and those are very strictly uh, timed by federal rules. If in fact any information is not correct and we were to forward the record or even more importantly the mandate to the wrong court, um, there's certainly a delay in, in the process and in justice because first we have to have the, the document returned to us, we have to um, locate the proper district and division, forward it to the district court, and I'm certain that it would create an adverse reaction to the litigants, to the parties involved. Uh, one of the primary challenges uh, is doing the mandate on time. Um, usually for us, we handle a lot of agency cases. It's 52 days from the date of the decision. And we have um, basically have some internal reports that we rely on to make sure that we're on time. And we also have a tickler system. So um, keeping track of that probably is the uh, primary challenge. Making sure the case moves through the system as quickly as possible. It's a very good reputation to have. Moving through the system as quickly as possible, that's a very good reputation to have. Those are good words. Uh, welcome back to our third panel. And we're going to focus on the issuance of the mandate and then finally the management of uh, of the records, getting all those records back, uh, the records that were utilized during the case closing phase. Uh, I've brought all the members of our panel back, and I'll introduce you to them again. We have Susan Dino, Brenda McConnell, and S Cynthia Motley. Let's jump right into our discussion. Here's the point where everything comes together, all the great staff work that's been done, all the work that's been done in, in chambers, uh, chambers now. Why is the mandate so important, and how is this accomplished? I'll toss it to you, Cynthia. Um, well, I think in terms of importance, it's, it's the last stage of the appellate process. And uh, um, it's the transfer of jurisdiction back to the lower court. And I think that's the, what makes mandate so important. In terms of uh, how it's accomplished in our court, it's somewhat of a procedural uh, uh, process. And uh, after the petitions for a hearing issues are, are resolved or any stays are, are resolved, uh, we have a tickler that indicates the deadline of when a mandate should issue. And we monitor that tickler. Um, and uh, we basically, at that time, issue uh, a certified copy for um, if we have a judgment or opinion of the opinion. And we also make a docket entry that generates a form, a mandate form, saying you know, that this is the official mandate for the case and distribute it back to issue distribution to the lower court and, and counsel. Brenda. Uh, it's similar in our court, return of the jurisdiction back to the district court or to the agency that the case originated from. Uh, we also use a, a form that issues the mandate in that uh, it's a cover letter that goes with the mandate. Our clerks are able to generate a weekly report in which they can uh, it's list out all the cases that are due to mandate that week and it gives them the opportunity to check the case to see if there's any outstanding petitions for rehearing, stays of mandate, uh, whatever kind of motion that they've they've got that they, to stop the case from issuing, and then um, we have a record rooms personnel 
James is his name, who issues our mandate. He is located in the record room because it's easier, we figured, to have him just pull the record close mm -hmm. to where he resides instead of having to have that record switched back and forth between the, the case closing and the record room. James runs a daily report and he double checks. He's a real good check and balance for us to make sure and there have been occasions where he's come and said, I'm not sure whether or not I should issue this opinion and it was a great catch. Thank you, James. And uh, he does a great <laughs> job for that. But uh, based on those reports, then we would do a cover memo that says that here's a copy, certified copy of the opinion, certified copy of the judgment, and that it is issued as the mandate. We also at that time will return the record back to the district court or the agency and uh, we'll also have any bills of cost would issue at that time with the mandate. So it really does give you a, a final opportunity to do quality control before yeah. that, uh, that mandate is finally uh, One uh, issued. Check. Mm -hmm. One last check, right? <laughs> right, Susan. Uh, we also work from a report, a mandate list that is printed every week and that will give us every case that is to be mandated that week or at least the deadline is set for that week. So we will uh, work from that list and, and check the cases and aims to make sure that they really are ready and that there's no pending rehearing petition. Um, we were from that list as well to automatically deny those petitions like I mentioned earlier. So if it is ready to mandate uh, we will do that and basically the issuance of the mandate um, confuses a lot of people because the entry on um, that is made in Ames shows mandate issued and we get calls from even counsel and, and pro se people, you know, well, I want a copy of that. And what they don't realize is, is really they already they have, have a, a copy. Yeah. It is just a certified copy of that original opinion and judgment or judgment itself that goes back to the district court, the lower court, mm -hmm. and um, that, again, returns jurisdiction to them. And especially if the case has been reversed or remanded, then that cues them it's time for them to do what they need to do. And we will. Uh, will copy. When, at the same time that we send the certified copy of the opinion to the district court, we just send a letter mm -hmm. to counsel telling them that it has been done so they know. We've actually talked quite a lot about tickler systems and the importance of communication, tickler system related to timing and so forth and so on. And it is a very super sensitive uh, of issues uh, since the issuance of the mandate does officially officially start the clock running for the lower court, especially if it's been uh, been remanded. Right, it's it's our way of letting the judges know that in in the event that we've reversed and remanded back to the district court, that they can go ahead and take whatever action our court directed on in our opinion. And um, in our court, we do give them copies of any denials of the petitions for rehearing as a heads up. Eight days from now, the case will come back to you and. And we do that sort of to stave off any phone calls that we might receive because the judges are anxious. If they've been told to do something by the court, they want to get right at it. And, you know, petitions for rehearing is just a nuisance to them because it delays that whole process. They want to get mm -hmm. going. So mm -hmm. we give them a copy of that to let them know eight days from now you will be able to start that schedule, you know, for whatever responses you want to get or go ahead and set the hearing. Um, again, we mentioned uh, that time limit. timeliness is such a key. We have uh, Jennifer Flowers, who is a docketing supervisor from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on the line with us. Uh, Jennifer, take just a minute to describe the tickler system that uh, staff utilizes uh, to uh, monitor mandates in your circuit. Hello. Hello. We have developed a manual tickler file system for staff to daily monitor mandates to be issued here in our court. The tickler files contain mandates and copies of orders that set deadlines for someone to do something um, to ensure proper case management um, of the cases. Uh, when a disposition is filed, there's a tickler date generated by Ames. Disposition documents are placed in the mandate drawer for the appropriate date of issuance. And these tickler files are located on each staff's desk and is a backup to the computer tracking system. Staff are to check the files on a daily basis. And we found that it works really well because the mandates are issued timely and our case closeout reports are actually minimized and accurate. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, where are these, where is the tickler located? I, I know in some circuits there is a central location where folks go to um, 
uh, access files uh, that uh, that will give the appropriate dates. Um, uh, where is it located uh, in terms of the uh, the deputy clerk? The tickler files um, again are located on each staff member's desk that is responsible for handling um, a case number. Mm -hmm. And in the in the event one of the staff members are out, the tickler file is located. Um, in an area that can be visibly seen and accessed. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I want to turn now to another person who has uh, submitted to us a, an effective practice that uh, folks should have if they've downloaded their materials, and that's uh, Mary Ann McMain, a deputy clerk with the D.C. Circuit. Um, explain to us, Mary Ann, the, the, um, the practice that uh, your uh, circuit has instituted relating to transfer of cases. Hi, Bob. Can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. Uh, we transfer cases uh, much like, but they're different from um, disposition of cases where they go to a district court, occasionally on order or by direction of the multi-district uh, uh, litigation panel. Uh, things have to move to different circuits in the, uh, for the appeals courts and also for the um, district courts. So what we wanted to do was to make sure we could get all of the files and all of the materials to the recipient court as quickly as we could and also receive acknowledgement of it. Um, that meant dealing with motions quickly. Uh, any, when we get an order from the MDL panel, we case administrators can go ahead and deal with issuing a standard order transferring the court. Then once all pending procedural motions are taken care of, we run a copy of the docket of the case and send all of the materials to the recipient case uh, by certified mail so we get an acknowledgement back that the materials have been received. And that seems to make everybody happy. Well, that's important. <laughs> and again, for uh, viewers who are interested in, uh, in knowing more about that, that's part of, I believe, your downloadable materials, that, uh, that effective practice that uh, Mary Ann uh, described. Thank you so much for joining us, Mary Ann. Okay, we now have uh, all of these records, right? Some paper, some not. There are exhibits. Uh, how do you get them back to the proper folks? Do you have any local rules covering that or whatever? We're going to turn to you, Brenda. Well, um, we don't really. We do have a few local rules about the size of exhibits, but the records ours is in a um, unique court, well, one of three unique courts <laughs> that actually get the record on appeal in every single case, and we keep track of that in our record room. It's a rather large area. We've overspilled into the basement and uh, uh, other offsite places because of how many that we receive, but uh, we have some great record room folks who keep real good track of where those cases are for us. Uh, when we receive that we don't even receive the record from the district court until after briefing is complete so while briefing is going on the uh, attorneys have access to it because the attorneys are usually in the city where the record is being kept but once briefing is complete it comes up to here and then it becomes our responsibility mm -hmm. to keep up with it and we do send the record out to the judges it does get passed around as the opinion gets, gets passed around to the different judges um, We've had a few problems with that in, uh, when it comes time to issuing the mandate that um, the VJs, uh, VJs sometimes think that that record belongs to them. It's just a copy of the original. And we had one incident uh, years ago where the mandate clerk issued the mandate because we don't stop the mandate because we don't have the record. We will go ahead and issue that. That's, that's uh, rule driven. And so the mandate clerk called the judge and asked, okay, could you please return the record to us? And they went, oh, we threw it in the trash. We <laughs> thought it was our copy. So then it became my duty to reconstruct the record because we had reversed and remanded that case and the district court oh judge gosh. really needed it. So uh, that was, so now what we do on our labels, it says property of the 11th circuit and that's our way of politely letting the judges know, get that back to us. There's an effective finish. practice, folks. There. <laughs> <laughs> it's ours, Just don't keep it. So, um, and then the records sometimes can be very small, can be very large. Uh, in our court, if it's more than 15 volumes, it doesn't get submitted to the, the court. They go on the, our record excerpts, and if they want the record at that time, you know, we will send it to them. But uh, we can, we've had records as small as one volume. We've had uh, another a case that we're handling right now that is over 30 boxes long, oh and that doesn't yeah. even include the exhibits. 
And then we've had our share of interesting exhibits, too. We've, um, many, many years ago, we had a um, car bumper come to us as an exhibit to a case. So for that, and as a result, uh, we also had a large box of uh, Klondike bars, which we all got real excited about until we opened them up and realized they were just the wrapper around styrofoam. Well, I guess we should have known better. <laughs> Melted chocolate. Well, you were tampering with exhibits. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, because of that, we have a local rule that says if it's an oversized exhibit, like a great big blow-up picture or chart, that um, it is council's responsibility to send it to us. Mm -hmm. And also at the end of the case, it is council's responsibility to have it returned and James will call the attorney and say it's ready to go back you need to make arrangements to come and get this we'll either get their FedEx number or they'll tell us we don't want it back thank you we got the originals here at home and then you can and do whatever with it so it sounds like your exhibit room is uh, alternately packed and then well, emptied <laughs> packed <laughs> and empty we do we try to we try to by attrition get those things moved out yeah. of there mm -hmm. there you go um, Cynthia, what about in your in your court? Uh, well, we don't get the record in every in every case, so we're we're somewhat different in in that regard. Uh, what we get is what we call a short record, and that's uh, what we use to open the case. And then, um, if the case is going to oral argument or if, uh, uh, required by the court or or by the attorneys, in some cases, we'll we'll get the record. Mm -hmm. And um, but we don't. Uh, that's pretty much in terms of, uh, we don't have your problem in terms of the volume of, of, we do get in cases, I mean, we do get large cases where we will get the 20 boxes, but we try to hold off. We try to, for the district courts to keep the record as much as possible because uh, we have uh, in our circuit, in Wisconsin and Illinois, uh, uh, Indiana rather, um, just to make it more, more accessible to attorneys to prepare their brief. And so later on, that's when we'll, we'll request the record if, if we require it. Susan, any bumper stories? <laughs> no, no bumper stories. Uh, we, we do not get the original file or the original record in every case either. We'll get a clerk's record that's just a concise, unless it's a pro se case, and, and then we'll get that original record. But because our office is, is divided into departments and is task specific, uh, my closeout department doesn't handle the records, but we too have a James, <laughs> and he handles those for us, so he'll work from a report of cases that we've mandated, and as soon as we've done that, then that's his cue to gather the records and get those back. And we do have a local rule that requires all trial exhibits too, so we get a fair amount of trial exhibits. But. Mm -hmm. But since I don't work in the records department, I, there may be a bumper story that I missed. I don't know. <laughs> but it accentuates the, that you have all this correct data right up front in order to know where it goes back and so forth and so on, mm -hmm. the lower court and, and, and whoever. Uh, before we end, I, I want to talk a little bit about, um, I have you talk a little bit about um, staying the mandate. Um, do you ever run into that situation, and how is that how is that handled? Well, we, we get several motions for stay of the mandate. Uh, mostly, the reason for wanting to stay the mandate is so that can, they can go to the Supreme Court, because they feel they have a shot at getting the either us reversed or the district court reversed. So, what they want to do is not have our opinion and judgment become the mandate, or to relinquish jurisdiction until after the Supreme Court has had their say in it too. And those are due to be filed before the expiration of the mandate time. If the motion is received on time, we go ahead and send it to the to the writing judge of the of the opinion, unless of course it's a VJ again. But um, if that motion is not received in time, that mandate issues and it's out of there, and it's one less case we have to deal with. And for recalls, we also get motions for recall of the mandate. But we have a local rule on that that if it's not received or if it's received more than a year after we have issued the mandate that we do return it back to the council or the pro se that files that with a polite little note that says we've received it it wasn't timely received thank you um, sometimes they get a little adamant about it and they'll <laughs> send it back and say no 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 you get that to a judge because I want a judge to see this Mr. Clerk I don't want to hear what you have to say so we do give it to a judge and the judge tells them no thank you <laughs> Is it similar in your circuits? Uh, 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 pretty much, um, yeah, I, I would say. Okay, mm -hmm. Susan. Same yeah, thing we uh, we do we do get motions to stay the mandate, and we will send those to the court. Uh -huh. um, and if we receive them after 
the mandate's been issued, especially if it's just a day or two after, um, we'll just treat it as a motion to recall the mandate and send it off. Um, I wish we had a local rule. That well, that, you're talking about the local rule about after a year. After the year. Yeah, so they can come in much time. later, in fact? Oh, much later. Yeah, we have a few. Another you know, Mostly fact. prisoners <laughs> that, you know, send us their motion to recall once a year. But you do have to be careful with those motions because sometimes it can be a new case, basically, and they're just trying to reopen their old one instead of paying a fee to, to open a new one. So we take a good look at those and make sure that we don't need to direct them to file right. a new case. Right. Um, I'd like to go around the table one, one last time before we uh, uh, close. And I, uh, what I want to do is take the opportunity, since this is the, our, our third um, session on um, the administration of appellate cases, and then I'd like the three of you to identify what you feel are some key skills that uh, appellate case managers really need to have to, to perform their varied responsibilities most, uh, uh, most effectively. And I'm not talking just case closing, but uh, how you feel about the, the skills they need to have in all the aspects of their job, all the way from case, uh, case opening. And uh, what would you highlight? Uh, um, I would say definitely an eye for detail. Uh, what we do is very, um, you know, uh, detail-oriented, uh, particularly at the, age, at the stage of, of case closing, uh, and I would say time efficiency. Uh, we deal a lot with deadlines, and so uh, we require the attorneys to be timely with their filings, and likewise, we also need to be on top of it and making sure that we issue things timely and efficiently. Susan? Yeah, absolutely, and I, for detail, and just... Uh, knowing how to prioritize since we do work with with the opinion work and there's there's great deadline demands there um, and timeliness um, then you need to know how to prioritize the rest of your work that's got to be done as well so Brenda I'm going to give you uh, the last brief word on this <laughs> oh, the last word. Oh, uh, sit back relax now <laughs> Actually, I agree with both the ladies. Uh, attention to detail, the timeliness, it's very important because we do have specific deadlines that we need to meet. Um, when we're looking to hire a new case closing clerk, one of the things that we do look for is someone who can pay attention to the detail, who is, uh, has a skill in organizing because that is a skill and it's an effective skill, one that is very necessary to what we do because if you can't organize your work in a way that helps you to efficiently process that work, then the work doesn't go to the court on time, and that does not make the judges very happy. So if they're able to prioritize by date or, or set up little sections that, so that someone who comes in while they're on leave or something can just sit in and start doing their work, that's important too. That's something that we look for also. Uh, one other skill I think that is necessary is, uh, is a degree of customer service skills. We deal a lot with the public, whether that be pro se prisoners and uh, non-incarcerated pr uh, pro se, the attorneys, and, and God love them. We all know that sometimes dealing with attorneys is not the easiest thing to do. They always have a reason, an excuse, and we have to sit there and listen to that and guide them through because the, you know, it is our job to help them. We are the liaison. We are the first person that they come into contact with. We represent the court. So mm -hmm. customer service skills, I think, is important. Also, that's our external customer. We have internal customers, our judges. We need to have the diplomacy and, and the degree of tact to deal with our judges. They all have different personalities. And God bless them. They, you know, <laughs> sometimes. Love too, huh? God love them, too. That's right, Susan. <laughs> and, and then our internal, our, our own sure clerks that we work with ourselves in the different departments. We need to be able to work with each other to get that work through because it is our job to shepherd it through. I think that's a great way to segue to the, to the end of this broadcast. It's, it's a vital job. It's an important job. It's not an easy job regardless of the phase of appellate case, uh, case administration. Uh, today we've had an opportunity in this broadcast to look at appellate case closing, not only from the perspective of how it's uh, implemented in the circuits, but also what challenges, uh, uh, that, uh, the challenges that court staff face and the practices they use uh, to meet the challenges. Um, we hope you found this broadcast uh, not only interesting, but directly related to what you do on the job. And again, I want to thank uh, the panel that uh, very graciously, uh, generously took of uh, of their time, gave of their time, uh, Susan Dino, Brenda McConnell, and Cynthia Motley. 
Uh, also, I just a note, I want to thank our planning committee, and those names uh, you're going to find in your downloadable uh, 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 materials. Uh, we had a number of folks in this broadcast and in all our broadcasts share some of their effective practices, and that really is such an important part of the learning uh, process. Uh, finally, the folks from the Second Circuit where the roll-ins uh, were filmed. Uh, I want to thank them and also Roseanne McKechnie, the clerk, for allowing us to come and, and giving us uh, her time, and uh, Fernando Galindo, the chief deputy, who really took care of a lot of the logistics. Um, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Justice Souter because uh, I think it says it all. Whatever court we are in, whatever we are doing, at the end of our task, some human being is going to be affected. Some human life is going to be changed in some way by what we do. We had better use every power of our minds and our hearts and our beings to get these rulings right. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you on our next FJTN broadcast.